here with uh, Dr. Hans Schattel, uh, professor of political science at uh, Yonsei University in the Republic of Korea. And today we will discuss global citizenship and global citizenship education. Welcome to Yonsei, Milian. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, obviously, you are teaching at university level, and um, uh, my first question will be uh, a really straightforward question. How do you define global citizenship, and how you define global citizenship education? Well, I think, as you know from my work, I don't push a particular definition. But I suppose if I had to boil it down, say to just a few words, yes. Uh, since I studied uh, how lots of people around the world think about the concept in yeah. practice and yeah. tried to distill from that yeah. what it means to the larger collective of individuals so scattered all over that think of themselves as global yes. citizens, I came up with awareness, responsibility, and participation. So you could say that a global citizen is active, responsible, and engaged, really engaged. in any kind of context. And mm -hmm. that can be a local context as well yes. as an international context. Right. It can mean that you're fighting school bullying in the local community where you live mm -hmm. because you want children mm -hmm. of all backgrounds to respect each other or yeah. that you're fighting for your local community to have a better recycling program than it currently right. does because right. you are concerned about the sustainability of the earth yeah. or it can mean that you're getting involved in humanitarian causes um, yeah. from from the vantage point of your your kitchen or your computer tablet wherever you're right. You're working. So the whole idea that is the world has become interconnected yeah. and that states cannot solve problems these days on their own. Many problems anyway. Some problems they can solve on their own, but there are lots of others that right. really transcend the capacities of states that yeah. people have to catch up and people have to, in many ways, people are ahead of states, that people have to, yes, continue to situate themselves in their nation states and in their cities and towns, but also think about the right. impact that their choices and the choices sure. in their political communities really have on the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess that in a sense is my, my view of global citizenship. I don't know if it counts as a definition, but it's my outlook anyway. Right, right, right. Well, it's interesting. And, and then when it comes to operation, operationalize the concept of global citizenship, and so when we start talking about global citizenship education, I'd like to ask you two questions, and, and they are interconnected. The first one is, how do you define global citizenship education? In the past, we had global education. So it's a double question. On one side, your definition of global citizenship education, and also how mm -hmm. the concept differentiates from the previous conception of global education. Well, in addition to global education, say mm -hmm. being a separate category, there's also citizen education exactly. or civic education, exactly. what we call in the States. Right. So civic education, well, in, in the most grim or, I guess, regimented way of thinking about it, it means don't litter, you know, don't pick on your friends at school, listen to your teacher, listen yeah. to your parents. Obey the law, stop at a red light. Traditional um, moral Right. Values. So and here in Korea, for instance, it's called Dodok, you know, national right. ethics. Right, and right, right. So many kids <laughs> tend to dread those classes yeah. or sometimes my own children say if I'm preaching to them, you say, Oh, you sound like our Dodok teacher now. <laughs> you know, that's what right. happens when you're unfortunate to have a parent who's a right. political science right. professor, right. I guess. Right. So there's that element of civic education. So global citizenship education, I mean you're right that it's a compound Exactly. emphasis on education. So it's taking bits of civic education, bits of global education, right. and putting it in all one neat little, hopefully attractive package. Now, global education, if we take the notion of global, and again, say, go back to David Held and Tony McGrew and their work on globalization, they yeah. emphasize not just the interconnectedness of the world or the extensiveness that the world's connections now mm -hmm. spread, mm -hmm. but also velocity, speed, that the world is getting connected at faster right. and right. faster rates right. of speed. And there, sure. therefore, again, we're all morally implicated in what kind of a world we're shaping. Right. So I think global education by itself mm -hmm. is to understand those mm -hmm. dynamics, and then global citizenship education is about what we do, agency, voice, empowerment, right. empathy, right. what kinds of qualities people yeah. need to thrive and help their communities thrive and also help the world 
be left to the next generation in a better state than it is now. Sure. And sure. that's not entirely different from civic education. If you're doing civic education in a community or a country, you also hope that your bounded political community will be left in better shape to the next generation. Right. And that the habits and ethics and even morals of the citizenry, yeah. I don't mean to sound too preachy, but that they, that they too will continue to improve and more rights, um, you know, greater... A great. I, I tend to look at citizenship, of course, you know, being, I guess, a Westerner from a liberal democratic context. I think there's some universality to that right. notion of democracy as well. So, you know, a, a world in which rights, more people are finally having their rights fully expect, uh, respected than in the past. Mm -hmm. So that, too, in a global dimension has affinities. Right. Where you could say human sure. rights education. So there's a lot that can be bundled in to global citizenship education. Yeah. All right, that's very interesting. So... This ties, in a way, uh, to a second question, uh, or third question, uh, about how you actually implement the concept of global citizenship or global citizenship education in your current classes. Uh, here at Yonsei University, you are teaching uh, a lot of students, I guess, and uh, I'm interested in uh, knowing how you actually implement the concept. So a couple of different ways. I mean, and you well know that even educators debate whether it's better to take the idea of global citizenship and yeah. infuse it across the yeah. curriculum. So you might never actually talk about global citizenship, but there are elements of global awareness or understanding or responsibility that work their way into classes That's or just recognition yeah. of an interdependent world. Um, and then there are schools and colleges that actually you know, put the concept right out there in their mission statements and we'll have classes or certificate programs sure. that are often supplemental to the usual classroom experiences. Right. I mean, I'm sometimes a little bit skeptical of global citizen certificates. You mm -hmm. know, if you take a language for two semesters and travel to, right. I don't know, Switzerland or Afghanistan for a week, then voila, you're a global citizen. And then you can just go home back to your cocoon after that. Right, I, right, right. I don't really know if that works. But I think some elements of it can work. I, 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 it depends on how the program's put together. Um, here at Yonsei, we don't have anything like that. Um, we do have, actually, in our international college, mm -hmm. global citizenship has worked into the mission. Yeah. But my teaching has always been just autonomous, really, from how the, the university right. defines itself. Although Yonsei, of course, founded by missionaries mm -hmm. um, from around the world with global connections. So my classroom, which is what I think you're asking, right, right. I, I teach two classes at the undergraduate level. Uh -huh. One is on the idea of global citizenship. One right. is on cosmopolitanism. Right. They're interconnected. They target different groups of students. The mm -hmm. global citizenship one is for students in our English language only degree program. Yes. The cosmopolitanism class is for yes. students across the entire university. Right. Most of those students operate mainly in Korean, but we have right. so many that are fluent in English, of course. Right. So those two so you're courses, teaching in English, I'm so teaching you're entirely yeah, in English, yes. English. And those two courses are interdisciplinary, and what holds them together is a focus on the notion of political membership and belonging and responsibility in an interconnected world. So there's a little bit of political philosophy at the yeah. start of the courses yeah. where we, you know, what is cosmopolitanism? What is global citizenship? And of course, those are very much connected as well. How does it relate with globalization? How does it relate with, right. you know, liberalism as the classic idea in you know, democratic right. political community? Right. How does it uh, connect with universal horizons in our moral thinking. You know, how does it relate with nationalism or clash with it? This semester I'm doing a module right. on populism. How does it... Um, Which is very core, actual and core. Right. Yeah. How does it differentiate itself from populism or how do par populists part company with it? Right. And then we become a little bit more pragmatic. So we look at migrants, transnational activists, international institutions, how there are different um, kind of epicenters or different segments of the population that would fit into the notion of cosmopolitanism or global citizenship. And then, then I, we, after the midterm, I depress the students. We look at a <laughs> series of very intractable problems, nuclear proliferation, right. um, terrorism, global warming, environmental degradation, even biodiversity or the loss of it, um, slavery, labor exploitation in the world economy. And, you know, right. And then we bring it all back by looking at global governance and really effective government at any level. What does it take to try to address the kinds of problems that we've just studied? And we also sometimes will look at global citizenship through different regional contexts, particularly mm -hmm. since we're in East Asia. How do people in East Asia think about the idea and how is it different from the way it's 
communicated out in the West. Right. So, right. so that that's basically the course in a nutshell. But on the other hand, I also in, my, in really all my teaching, I teach media and politics. I teach European politics, U.S. politics, and the intro to politics, and really all my classes. Right. I think probably one way or another, since I'm interested in the concept, mm. I'm always encouraging students to think about the political world from multiple perspectives, not just from just Korea the or from the U.S. Yeah, Try to put the yourself animals. in the shoes of yeah. of any particular region or country that we're studying and see mm -hmm. things from different sorts of points of view. So that's right. also very important, I think, in right. education and, right. and helps students um, hone their analytical skills too. All right, that's interesting. So the multiple perspectives is definitely a key element in your, in your teachings, that's my understanding. So developing students, um, uh, multiple perspectives of what happens. Sure, and also to think deeply about what they're reading and to think from every angle about what they're reading. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, next question obviously is on uh, uh, success and challenges. What are the responses from the students? Uh, if you can share something about that, that would be really interesting uh, because one of the uh, major uh, concern where we are teaching global citizenship is to understand whether our students um, can actually develop certain um, um, how we can say competencies, right? Um, so, or whether their outlooks or their um, world views, in a sense, exactly, are exactly. changing or developing in any exactly, way as a result yeah. of what they're being taught. Well, that's exactly, true, of exactly. course, for any kind of um, yeah. character education yeah. project, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But we are trying, in a way, in our own ways, to make a difference mm -hmm. and to add some value mm -hmm. on what we are teaching. Yeah. Uh, what and of we course, sometimes we never really know. I mean, the only way to really measure the impact of any kind of education. You know, however, whatever the program is, is really to follow students through their life courses and see yeah, what yeah, that's you know, tracks they take or how they develop their lives. And even then, you can't necessarily assign a cause and effect right. relationship between whatever it is they've learned in the classroom and how they go about it, because people's circumstances change. Um, but I do, uh, and I don't do any kind of long-term longitudinal surveys of my students or where they're ending up. You or don't? Whether. No, okay. maybe the college it would be should, actually. It would be interesting. <laughs> if I found a research grant that, that funded that, maybe I'd consider it. Yeah. But I do a fairly extensive survey in addition to the mm. usual uh, university evaluations, which are basically quantitative. Right, I, right. I do hand out a survey, and I keep it all anonymous. I always have my graduate mm. assistant hand it out and collect it and hold right. it until the term is over to just make it really anonymous. And what are the responses? Um, well, they're interesting. I mean, I have to tell you the questions, I guess. I, I ask if the course met their expectations or what their expectations were. Was it any different from what they expected? Right. Did they look forward to coming to class? What sections of the class were most effective? What sections were least effective? Right. You know, what advice would they have for students taking yeah. the course in the future? Would they recommend the course to other students? Right. I mean, generally, I get favorable responses from right. these surveys. I, the students say it's a lot of work to try to blend all the, these different elements yeah, that I yeah. throw at them and digest it all. Mm -hmm. um, I think the students generally feel at the end of the course that they have a greater sense of comprehending, trying to have the tools to comprehend the problems in the world and think about what to do about them. Um, For example, uh, I'm asking because it would be interesting to hear a, a concrete experience. Uh, did you have a student coming to you and say, okay, thank you, Dr. Shuttle, I mean, like, this, is, this, is, was, this class was really interesting and as a result of that, uh, I really developed an interest into something specific or I changed my way of acting on, on a daily basis. So uh, such experiences, I'd be curious to know whether this happened to you, having students sharing with you such... Yeah. Uh, oh, it happens to me as well. You know, I might be more cautious not wasting water for a few days after right. covering it with my class or hearing oh, something really? from a student. So, so it goes, goes every, uh, goes every so direction. <laughs> I one time, I mean, I don't know. I mean, most of the time, I think the students are—they hear some. I mean, in any class, you hear something, and your life might change in a very subtle way if you don't necessarily have a right. lightning bolt. Right. But I did have—I've had a few, and I had one student, for instance, who we read uh, the book *Disposable People* by Kevin Bales, uh -huh. which uh -huh. talks at length about, as you may know, people that are basically stuck in slavery conditions. Right. You know, tw Bales estimated this was as of 2003, I think. It was around the time I started teaching this course, and yeah. Bales estimated at the back then, I don't know what the count is now, but at the time there were 27 million people around the world, and 
you know, sort of involuntary forms of labor. I mean, Bales defines a slave as somebody who's working in you know, horrible coercive conditions, but not just because they've agreed to go to work, but they're being held under some threat of violence. And right, if they try right, to right. escape, there'll be some sort of violent retaliation. Yeah. So one of the countries that was in focus was Thailand. Mm, mm. And this particular student had grown up in a community where there were a lot of Thai people and you know, knew a lot of people from Thailand, had a lot of empathy for the country and right. the culture. And the stories of the slavery, the like teenage slavery there that affects a lot of young women really shocked him and horrified him. And he eventually went to Thailand and was, he was a business major and he was interested, I mean talk about social entrepreneurship, he was interested right. in trying to start some sort of initiative that would um, basically give women from rural Thailand or the parents of these young women who sell them off into prostitution, give them another outlet, give them another right. opportunity. And what he found when he got there was, you know, what Bales was documenting was just so heavily ingrained in the culture. I think he got to Thailand and wasn't really sure where to begin. Right. I don't think he ever did create any kind of initiative in that regard. I think yeah. he he instead went to Thailand and just tried to understand why things were the way they were in that culture right. and, and in the back of his mind trying to think what it would take to change it and realize that well sometimes one person can make a difference but you know, he was going to need more financial backing than a university student traveling abroad could do but but yes in his case he went abroad and he did an independent study project that I supervised he wrote up a paper about his experiences and what he observed there and I think actually the the effect that it had on him to go there was he went from being just sort of aghast and horrified that there was this problem involving sexual slavery in Thailand as a student reading the book and discussing in the classroom to going over there and looking at it and going out, I think he went out into the countryside yeah. and he got to know some of the families just living there and he began to see why some families end up going in that direction. I don't think he approved of it and I think he was still very uncomfortable about the whole thing. Right. Um, but he began to understand it from their point of view. And he realized what he what what could be done, and maybe what would be harder to accomplish, right, at least right. in the near term. And and King, you know, just reckoned himself with some of the complexity of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know if that. I mean, for him, I think then he went off and had a business career back home, and right, right. you know, that was just a broadening experience that he took with them. So sometimes students do have that. I I didn't actually encourage him to go to Thailand either. I didn't necessarily want in. him spending all that money and putting right. all that time into it, but he really wanted it. And right, right. The, the course is what made him pursue that. So more. So the course him. was the course itself, and the specific book that, that he studied. That theme in the course, that and, week that we did slavery. And the effect there. was him going there. Yes, and, yes, for about a month actually. Yeah, during the summer break, right, I think, right. if I remember correctly. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you a more specific question regarding uh, some of the elements that you find uh, crucial uh, in your teachings in terms of. Um, what uh, areas you believe are most important to be covered when you're addressing your courses? Again, I'm coming from the discipline of political science, right, so my answers right. might be different from somebody in educational right. studies. Sure. But how we think about political community mm -hmm. and the nature of political community, that's an old question. You know, that goes back to the ancient polis, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. But of course, as our political world changes with mm. the rest of the world becoming more interconnected again, I still do think even if globalization is retrenching in some ways, or if the European integration project may be in going in reverse now, disintegrating, we still have you know all kinds of new sources of right. transnational connections every day. So it's it's still with us. The trend line just sort of goes up right. and the, you know sine wave up and down, up and down. Um, trend reversals, I guess, in, in an overall positive trajectory. Yeah. So how we think about the meaning of political community, mm -hmm. how we think about effective governance, not mm -hmm. just at the local level, but at the supranational level, um, how we think when we look at issues, how we yeah. think about the idea of responsibility, how right. and a lot of things I say in my class about how we allocate responsibilities, mm -hmm. which governments which kinds of governments, which sorts of international institutions and mm. businesses and mm. which mm. subsets of citizens should solve which problems. So trying to sort that in a sense in right. the classroom. So uh, in a way we discussed um, um, the main uh, concept of global citizenship and global citizenship education and how Dr. Shatzel interprets the concepts, how you interpret the concepts uh, and in a way how you implement the concepts in your uh, daily teachings. Um, I have two more questions. Uh, the first one is on your book. 
well, you, you've published extensively, but specifically I'd like to hear uh, two or three of the experiences related to your book, The Practices of Global Citizenship. You interviewed and surveyed a lot of uh, participants. Uh, what are the um, uh, experiences and the stories that in a way are staying with, staying with you uh, all along your teachings and, and publications and they in a way inspired you the most? Oh, so many stories, Emiliano. And <laughs> Of course, I interviewed about a hundred people, and I often would interview somebody, and they were all phone interviews because I just didn't have the money to do the field work. And yeah. the, the people were also scattered across such a wide, vast territory. I don't right. know how I would have ever managed to travel to all of them where they live. But you know, the people that talked to me were wonderful in terms of making themselves available and really opening up in the phone conversations. Right. And I would think, okay, this person that I just talked to, I wish they could meet. You know, this person that I spoke to a month ago or mm -hmm. so forth. I mean, if I had had the money, I would have brought them all together for a conference. But, I mean, the underlying point of the book was to respond to some of the skeptics of the idea of global citizenship. Right. Who, at the time I was doing my research, were saying, well, to be a global citizen is to be a citizen of an abstraction. To just yeah, focus on yeah. something too remote. Or there's nothing good about... You know, thinking of oneself in, as a citizen in global terms, that you just can't do it. It's a contradiction in terms, or hardly anybody could actually pull it off. Right. And I wanted to show, well, maybe it's not an idea that's universally spread and that realistically most people don't necessarily um, cast their right. horizons yet in global terms, although I think it's changing with the younger generations. Right. But that there is a growing cohort of people who really do... You know, walk the walk, not just talk the talk. It's not just philosophers and visionaries now who, you know, espouse the notion of global citizenship. That's it's not, it's yeah. not just Diogenes and, yeah. you know, outcasts from the city either. I also wanted to show that there are very much real people, and, you know, I guess as Kwame Anthony Appiah would say, rooted cosmopolitans, that there right. are people that, that, are, that are actually tied very much into their local communities and yet deploy themselves out in the international sphere. Yeah. So just a few of the people that I talked to that were memorable, and I used all their real names in the book, right. so I guess I can say them here. There was a woman named Rosie Brown who mm -hmm lived in Oklahoma and yep. all her adult life, I think from the time she was um, first married and having children, she would always bring international students into her household, often for short mm -hmm. periods of time, host yep. them. She was a host family through some sort of organization right. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I mean, not the kind of section of America right. that you typically think of as cosmopolitan, right? right. I mean, that's red America in the, in the political shorthand. But Rosie Brown, um, at some point had begun to think about what she did in terms of global citizenship and she was always writing letters to her local newspaper encouraging her fellow Tulsa residents to be global citizens and after the Soviet Union collapsed she went to Russia with a church group of hers and, and sometimes church-based activism fit into the way right. the people that I talked to thought of themselves as global citizens and she was involved she was meeting all kinds of elderly people I think basically her group was providing some social welfare services for right. impoverished older folks and part of that involved uh, serving dinners at night at a community venue I don't think it was a church but it was some sort of um, public space right. where they would right. set out tables sure. and everybody would come and have their cabbage soup so Rosie, bless her, she was noticing that the tablecloths were not in great shape after the meals, and she was actually taking them home to, her, to the apartment where she was living. I guess she had a washing machine, and she was cleaning them. And then she'd bring them back the next day in you know white, pristine form again. And she said to her, that little thing, right. you know, was the action kind was, of uh, um, in the in the sphere that she was in at that moment in the village that she was in in Russia. That was global citizenship for right. her. Interesting. You know, she she said to her that was all part of just being a global citizen. So and, and she admitted, oh, it's just a little thing, and it's just a limited group of people. But of course, it was a group of people that she had specifically reached out to. So that right. was one story that was very memorable. Um, I suppose some of the other folks that were memorable, Maud, Maud Barlow, who's very well known worldwide as a water rights activist, right. an environmental activist. She, for a time, was the leader of the Council of Canadians. Her story was just very interesting to me because she had started out working for Pierre Trudeau at the right. time. That I think even before Trudeau had gone to national office in Canada, she had started working for him in, I think, the province of Quebec. Right. 
and then had worked had moved up to national politics kind of alongside his career yeah, yeah. and then um was very much i think an activist for the canadian middle class and the canadian way of life vis-a-vis -vis the global economy trying to uh, in some in some cases articulate the interest of everyday working class canadians right, who were right. threatened in some ways yeah. by economic dynamics and then in the 1990s, she said to me her critical moment when she began to think of herself as a global citizen mm -hmm. was during a campaign in the mid-1990s, uh, maybe even mid to late 1990s, when several of the G7 countries were pushing the multilateral right. agreement on investment. And for Maud Barlow, she saw that as a bill of rights for corporations, yeah. not for people. Yeah. So she began to organize with all sorts of interest groups, labor unions, environmental groups, professional associations that would be adversely impacted. They, they stopped that thing dead in its tracks. You know, we don't have a multilateral agreement on investment today. I think some bits and pieces of it have kind of made their way into national laws. But, you know, that bit the dust. And Maud Barlow said to me in her interview, that was at that point when she saw herself as a global citizen activist and a part of a larger movement as right. well fighting it. And she, of course, went on to you know, be out in Seattle at the famous World Trade Organization meeting that, that went nowhere when there was supposed to be a new round of talks. So right. I'm not saying that global citizens, by definition, are always you know, there to be thorns in the side of economic globalization, or that they're always you know, sharing a particular conception of justice that they're working to implement in global terms. But for more Barlow, that was really it. But I was impressed by how she had started out in her local community. And that she saw what she was doing not in isolation from her local or national citizenship, right, but right. she brought it all together. So that was so the impressive national, about her story. And the the, the national and the, 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 the global, the international are tied together. In Interactive. Inter and maybe because, I mean, I think there can be Americans also concerned about how decisions from the U.S. Yeah. government might adversely affect certain groups in the right. U.S. But Barlow, maybe being from Canada, she also thought that there were various ways Canada as a country, that its own definition of its interests right. were going to be adversely impacted. So very, very expressly political approach to her work as a global citizen. Um, one more memorable, actually two more memorable cases, two <laughs> students that I knew that were um, both in Africa, placed uh -huh. in Africa for study abroad. Yeah. And they were both, I mean, both kind of short-term placements, but both of them were deeply affected by how they um, lived and experienced um, the communities in which they were planted in Africa. I think one of them had been in Kenya, in Nairobi, mm. uh, on an internship program, and the other was very briefly in Senegal as mm -hmm. a part of a French language immersion program that right. also had some, what we would think of in, in the West as like development studies perspectives worked right. into it. Right. And I mean, these trips were short, and critics could question whether you can really pick up a notion of global citizenship just by parachuting into a place. and interacting with the locals. But both students had really, I think, meaningful experiences right. with the local people. And their instructors, their professors or teachers had gone out of the way to to get them situated, to get them out of the tourist bubbles where they right. were. Keep them right. safe, but get them out of the tourist bubbles. And you know, they really did start to think about themselves. And I remember both of them saying, one of them in particular, saying how she had gotten back home. I think she was from Texas. And that you know she gets back home in Texas and sees the shopping malls all decorated prematurely for the holiday season and seeing people out wasting money and from her point of view at this point on Christmas gifts, she said she just couldn't relate to it in the same way. Right. Having just come back from Africa, I think it was the young woman who had gone but to But there is a lot of poverty and right. so this contrast. Right. She saw the poverty, but she also saw how open and warm the people were and that and it really I mean so often I mean this is probably somehow bound up with the idea of global citizenship. Yeah. Honestly the kids who do these immersion trips have to always learn that it's not really them doing something for the community they're visiting. Half the time, more than half the time, it's the host community that actually is even, doing something for the visitors, even though those kids are often much better off than the people in the host community. Right. Often they're benefiting more from the hospitality yeah. that the host community is extending for the, the visitors. Two, two and I ways. think she had, this student had really begun to feel that as well. She could recognize that. Right. So that was also a very memorable interview. Very interesting. All right, so the last two questions, and then we will conclude the interview. Um, the first uh, question is, um, I'm looking obviously extensively into the literature review around the concept of global citizenship and global citizenship education, and gradually the, the, the approaches to global citizenship that are emerging within the literature are related to 
uh, three main uh, themes. One is the neoliberal and the second one is what is called a radical approach to global citizenship and, and then you have a third one which is more uh, transformational. It does uh, global citizenship have a transformative power uh, itself when you're teaching it in your um, classes or do you see much more that kind of neoliberal uh, approach to it or you, you see elements of radical? Well probably what you describe as transformational would be the closest mm. that I would Why? see with some of the students mm. if they're trying to see the world in a way that's different from how they might have understood the world before they come into the class. I mean a right. lot of what I do and I suppose it's not limited to the global citizenship classes but I'm always trying to present to my students information or insights that they might not have otherwise encountered, that they mm. never would have thought about before. Mm. I mean, that's what I think a lot of professors are doing in any kind of discipline is, mm. you know, give students something new, so a new approach to view right. the world, right. or a new approach to think about a certain topic or a certain area of study. So I think any professor probably worth his or her salt is going to be trying to transform the outlooks or the intellect or the sentiments of their students one way or another. Um, I mean, not necessarily trying to brainwash them in any particular direction, but just get students to think more richly, think about um, issues from a wider set of vantage points than they might before they came to your class, at least understand the issue in broader terms. I don't, I don't necessarily, though, um, try to completely change, I don't want to upend the life trajectories that my students are setting out for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I just want them to f take the information from the class that they're getting and the perspectives that they're getting and then go forward with their lives. If, they're, if, they're, if they were planning to be an accountant, you know, after they take my class, they might still be an accountant. But they might be, who knows, they might be involved in some sort of philanthropic venture down the road, or if they're right. members of a church, they might jump into some sort of social action program <laughs> that they wouldn't have before. Right. Or they might vote for a different candidate who has a different perspective on immigration than they would have voted for because they're now paying attention to an issue. I mean, some of it is just putting issues right. and considerations on the radar screens of students that they wouldn't otherwise have. I mean, your three perspectives are very interesting. I don't specifically try to right. push my students or even situate my courses in any of them, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do expose my students to what you would think of as, I suppose, neoliberal thinking. If neoliberalism, in a nutshell, mm. means you know political mm. and economic policies with deregulation, privatization, mm -hmm, free trade, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we reckon with that. We look at that critically. We look at yeah, um, yeah. how it's become a kind of hegemonic approach to the yeah. global economy. Radical, I, I don't know, it really depends on how you define it. If it just means change, if it means taking the status quo, be it political or economic, or again, if you interpret neoliberalism as the status quo, mm -hmm. and then inverting that, fighting to overturn that completely, I mean, of course, lots of classes do look at activist groups that are challenging that model one way or another. Whether or not they're radical, I, I don't really know where you necessarily draw that line. Oh, I don't mean it in a bad or good way, really. Mm -hmm. But, but yes, I mean radical. I mean, you can be radical and say, all right, let's get off the internal combustion engine and push for electric cars straight right. away. And, right deal with this problem of global warming sooner instead of later. Get out in front of it. I mean, that could be interpreted, I guess, as a radical approach. I also think it could be interpreted as a conservative approach. If yeah, yeah. Conservatism implies being risk-averse about the future of the planet yeah. and yeah. having a conservation emphasis. So, I don't know. I'm not really sure the three... I'm not sure I buy the three categories yet. Sure, you sure. can sell them to me in, in the dissertation no, that no. you write. Yeah, not um, sure. Critical so. transformation, I mean, sure, I'm not against it. Who would be, right? I yeah. think any good university professor wants their yeah. students to think critically about a host of issues and also mm -hmm. to adjust their life plans as they learn more. As people learn more about the world around them, mm. ideally their perspectives and their even ambitions may change as a result. So I may have a student who's in my class that's going to be an accountant, perfectly good job, but after they are exposed to what we look at in my class, after they look at global issues that they might have never considered before, maybe that accountant will 
take on some sort of philanthropic endeavor right. on the side or be involved in a church social outreach group, not even necessarily international, maybe domestic. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are all different ways that people can take what they learn in a class about global citizenship education and connect it to their everyday life, I think, in all communities, even if they just stay in a local community. Interesting. All right, last question. Uh, what are, in your opinion, uh, global competencies? There is a lot of um, literature around the, the concept of developing students certain global competencies. And um, uh, what will be a good world leader, in your opinion? Because at the end of the day, uh, we are trying to foster uh, leaders for the future. Um, but we can't have everybody be a leader either. I no, mean, I sure, get so sure. many kids in coming in field, for in interviews. Field, yeah. So many of my students <laughs> who come in for missions interviews say, oh, I want to be a global leader. Yeah. And that's all well and good, but who's going to follow all these global leaders? If everybody's a global leader, right, then right. there's nobody left, really. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, we do want to, I mean, of course, every, again, every professor hopes that somebody that they're training will become some sort of world-famous figure and then come back in 40 years and pat the professor right, right, on the back right. and say, oh, it all started <laughs> <Thanks a lot. laughs> your class. I think so many academics yeah. feel like that kind of recognition is the ultimate yeah. payback. Yeah. But So, yes, we, we and at elite universities, and Yonsei would be one of them, we all want our students to right. be leaders and to do well. But, yes, any... I do think that, I mean, competency at any level is important, whether it's global or local or a competency tied to a certain discipline. I somewhat raise my eyebrows at the whole notion of global competency. Why? Because I, I ask, really, how do you measure that? And, you know, how, how extensively traveled or networked or um, versed in multiple cultures do you really have to be to be globally competent? Does that mean you have to have skills in three or four languages? You know, mm -hmm. say like your classic stereotype of a contemporary Dutch citizen who can speak, you know, <laughs> Dutch, French, English, and German, maybe a little bit of Flemish dialect or Spanish right. thrown in. You know, global competencies can very quickly end up being litmus tests. Yeah in which you know, we, we put these expectations on students that may or may not be realistic. Interesting. And, or they end up just getting watered down to sort of At amorphous of, uh, cliches yeah. that, that also don't necessarily have any meaning. But yes, I mean, I, I can certainly think about, in general terms, not necessarily global, yeah. but what kinds of competencies I want the next generation to have or want my own children to have. And Please. You know, certainly I would want them to have a sense of empathy for okay. people sense around the world and, and even people in their local communities that are worse off, thinking about how to improve conditions for people that are worse off than themselves. And that's, again, I guess those of us with the privilege to contemplate that in the first place are, you know, the ones that, that come up with these terms like global competency. But yes, thinking about it from the standpoint of improving life chances or improving um, the possibility for people to fulfill their inherent capabilities, right. that's, that's something that's important. Also for people to develop certain quantitative and uh, technological skills, scientific mm. reasoning skills, right. have a basic understanding of how scientific inquiry works, yeah. know, social science yeah. as well as yeah. the natural science, basic competency reading and thinking and listening, you know, able to comprehend, able to take a complicated paragraph and then digest its key meaning, boil down something complicated into something mm. that amounts to a simple um, essence. You, you take a, compl a long, complicated essay and figure out what the main point is very quickly. Right. You know, and be able to do that in a way and explain it to somebody maybe from a different cultural background. Explain one set of cultural norms to somebody from a completely different yeah. cultural background, yeah. even if it seems a little bit complicated. I would say an important global competency in the social media age is also being able to have a phone conversation and talk out loud to somebody. These days with the internet, and Sherry Turkle at MIT has kind of blazed a trail on this, that conversation takes a back seat. You know, millennial kids can't do job interviews as well as they should in many cases right. because they're right. so used to texting and emailing. People can hide behind their screens very quickly. So to get people to, I mean, face-to-face -face communication maybe is not something that's okay. thought of in international education circles as a global competency, but it's it should. it's very important as yeah, well. Okay. And I think language skills, because when you learn a language, you're also learning the underlying assumptions in the culture yeah. that went into the language, so that too is important. Interesting, very interesting. All right, so we're going to 
thank uh, Dr. Hans Schattel for participating in this interview. Uh, really thank you for this interview. I got a lot of uh, interesting points and I hope we can continue this work together in the future. Well, thank you for taking the time to seek me out. I enjoyed speaking with you, Emiliano. Thank, thank you. you very Good much. Good luck in your research. <laughs> I'll do my best.